All yours. All right. So this is what our outline looks like today. We're going to talk about, we're just going to go through an overview. We're going to talk about hemostasis um, and the stages of hemostasis. And we'll talk about hemorrhage and the stages of hemorrhage along with the assessment and management. Um, and then shock. When blood loss becomes shock uh, and what that means. So always in these kind of situations, like your traumas, it's a, it's an oh crap, um, right? Any kind of shock type patient. Um, and we'll, there's so many different definitions for the different kinds of shocks. We'll go through the, the main points and help kind of differentiate the ones that we really want you guys to understand and know. So what is shock? It is inadequate perfusion, right? I think a lot of You'll, you'll go even walk into an a emergency department and ask a nurse what shock is, and they'll say uncontrolled hypotension. That's not true, right? It's inadequate perfusion, regardless of what the blood pressure is. Um, so in, in a shock state, your body is naturally using up more oxygen, um, and you have a decreased delivery. So you're using more, and you're getting less. So your organs are inadequately uh, being perfused. Um, it doesn't meet the demand. Shock is shock on a system level. Is it an, on an organ level? Is it on a cellular level? It ends up affecting all, but what's its? It's on a cellular level. Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, demand issue, right? And that's on a cellular level. Um, on your, your tissues uh, are trying to get oxygen, trying to get glucose, um, but that's for their individual cells. So shock is definitely on a cellular level. Um, and then trying to get rid of your wastes, lactic acid, carbon dioxide. Um, and if it doesn't, if you don't have perfusion, um, you're not able to get rid of that CO2. You're not able to get rid of that lactic acid. And then what happens? What kind of acid-based state are you in? What kind of acidosis? Metabolic acidosis. Shock, metabolic acidosis. Remember that. I have a feeling it's going to show up. Um, so perfusion requires three things. It requires the pump. requires the conduit. And the conduit is your vessels, right? Your vasculature. And then it requires the volume, the, the liquid. In order to have adequate perfusion, all of those need to be working well. If one goes down, the others, the others try to compensate, right? So if you don't have enough volume, what happens to your vasculature and your pump? Yeah, you have constriction. Your heart rate goes up. Good. <laughs> so... Types of shock. Hypovolemic shock. This is dehydration and hemorrhage. Do your slides have one more here? I can't remember. I might have deleted something. But um, hypovolemic shock, obviously, you don't have volume, and these are the reasons why you don't have volume. Cardiogenic shock is a bad pump, right? Most of the time, it's heart failure. What causes acute heart failure? We know what causes chronic heart failure, and chronic heart failure is just going to eventually poop out, right? Like a pump that's been used poorly for a long time. Acute heart failure is what? Yeah, it is a STEMI until proven otherwise, right? It's a heart attack. Um, so if you've got a patient that doesn't have a history of heart failure and all of a sudden has super wet lungs, even though they're not having chest pain, and short of breath, they look like they're having an acute CHF exacerbation, but they don't have any history of CHF. What's going on? What's that? Yeah, so they've got flash edema. What's causing the flash edema? <laughs> Their pump's not working, right? Their pump's not working and fluid's backing up into the lungs. Pump's not working generally acutely because of a heart attack. All right? So that gets missed a lot, both in the emergency department and pre-hospital. 
um, because they treat those patients like chronic heart failure when they should be taking them to cath lab, right? Um, obstructive, so this is when you've got something plugging up your pipes, right? So uh, a pneumo is causing a backup so that you don't have any preload, right? <laughs> Pericardial effusion does the same thing. Pericardial effusion leads to what? One of the T's, tamponade. And why is tamponade bad? <laughs> what happens to your blood pressure in tamponade? Yeah, why does it go down? Yeah, because you've got so much fluid surrounding your heart, it's not expanding, right? It's not able to fill. So you're not having enough blood to pump back out. Um, and a couple cycles of that, and your body can't keep up. You've got hypotension. Um, it also causes increased intrathoracic pressure and uh, decreases your preload as well. A pulmonary embolism is another example of the obstructive um, uh, types of shock. Distributive shock. What's distributive shock? And you can kind of figure it out by the examples that you have here. It's also a problem with the pipes. It's just not obstructive. It is, yeah, your pipes just suck. Neurogenic shock, your pipes can't tighten up. Septic shock is the same thing as neurogenic shock, right? Because of all the things going on with sepsis and all the cytokines that are being released, you get vasodilation, but you have vasodilation everywhere. So the difference, what's the difference between looking at a patient with neurogenic shock and looking at a patient with septic shock? So what does the patient look like in neurogenic shock? Are they hot and are they hot and sweaty? Are they cold and clammy and pale? Cold, cold, cold and clammy and pale, right? Sepsis. What are they? The opposite. So they're both distributive shock, and they both work through similar similar means, but they present clinically differently. Anaphylaxis is closer to which one of these? Probably sepsis, right? Yet that histamine release causes vasodilation. Did you say that neurogenic can constrict patients? So, in, in neurogenic shock, they'll have peripheral constriction. They'll have that cold and clammy appearance. Now, below the injury, you'll have vasodilation. Um, but that um, is a sympathetic response. Um, and Parasympathetic still can control your recti pili in your skin and some of your vasculature in your uh, extremities, like surface vasculature. Um, so they, they give you a cold and clammy appearance. So if you got something somewhere in your cervical spine, you're going to be flushed. You, know, you will have significant, significant vasodilation. Um, Priapism. They still have their erecti, their erecti pili muscles, um, which causes you know like your goosebumps and that kind of thing, um, and restricts peripheral blood flow. Um, is still is still kicked on. Um, so cardiogenic shock. This is a problem with the pump, right? It can't pump enough blood to support uh, the body. Um, this is usually, cardiogenic shock is usually a problem with your left ventricle because that's where your systemic pump is, um, right? Secondary to acute myocardial infarction um, or CHF. Um, now, why would many patients have normal blood pressures? And cardiogenic shock. Everything else is working fine except that blockage. Good. The pump's not working all that great, but everything else is working pretty well. So you still got massive vasoconstriction everywhere else, making up for your bad pump. Your vasculature is really trying to trying to do its job. Now, 
to a point, that's going to fail, right? Eventually, that's going to fail um, if it's not getting enough perfusion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Until you'll see an elevated heart rate until those oxygen demands um, really start to come into play. So when the heart's blood flow, meaning its coronary system, its own blood flow, um, is not consistently getting what it needs because the pump's bad, it'll eventually start to become bradycardic. But that's later on. As soon, when, a, when a cardiogenic shock patient starts to become brady, bradycardic, they're going to be they're going it's going to be an arrest pretty quickly, like seconds. That's why you always see you know patient brady down and then lost you know became unresponsive. Um, so in cardiogenic shock, you want to improve all the parameters that you can, right? Administer oxygen, assist ventilations, elevate the patient's head and shoulders. Um, IV access, dopamine is going to help with that pump, right? Help with contraction um, and uh, get that conotropic effect. Hypovolemic shock, when you don't have enough volume, these are the patients oftentimes that have that altered level of consciousness. They don't have the volume, their brain's not being perfused. These guys are uh, certainly pale, cold, and clammy. Um, Blood pressure will try to hold on, but then it'll fail. Um, and uh, the pulse initially can be normal, and then it then it'll spike um, when it does start to fail, and the heart's trying to um, make up for that volume. Um, and because there's not an initial problem with the heart, the heart's trying to do all it, all it can. The heart doesn't necessarily fail, uh, but as all of those demands sneak up on them, it'll go into different cardiac arrhythmias. These patients oftentimes go into BFib. So with hypovolemic patients, you want to control the bleeding, right? Keep the patient warm. Why do you keep the patient warm? What's bad with a cold patient? And I'm talking with like a bleeding hypovolemic patient, if you if you don't keep them warm, the bleeding worsens. Cold lessens coagulation. So if you keep the patient, if the patient uh, remains cold, they have less uh, coagulation effect. So try to make that patient warm, and they'll their body will help out how with their own bleeding uh, better than you can. Um, so administer a crystalloid solution um, on a non-trauma patient, meaning no blood loss, you can give a bolus, right, crystalloid or colloid. With trauma patient where there is a blood loss, you want to, and Joel talked about this a little bit, uh, permissive hypotension. Why do you want to allow permissive hypotension instead of just giving in volume? If you don't want to blow out the clots, absolutely true. If you increase that blood pressure a little bit, you, you can blow out all those clots. Why else? ICP. What's that? ICP. ICP, you actually want to overcome the ICP with the blood pressure so you can have some perfusion. Water. I'm talking about bleeding. So a patient is bleeding. GI bleed, low extremity bleed, whatever. They're losing blood because they're bleeding out. And you want, and you don't, you don't want to try to get their blood pressure up to 120, right? Because what are you giving him in order to increase his volume? Thin him out. Exactly, you're going to thin him out. So you're going to make his bleeding worse, right? Because you're not giving him red blood cells in the ambulance. You guys are going to be giving him normal saline, right? Even if you were giving him Red blood cells, does that thin them out? Yes, yeah, exactly. It doesn't have clotting factors. So it's almost the same as giving normal saline because you do nothing to stop the bleeding. You actually make the bleeding worse. You dilute what clotting factors he already has. So especially in GI patients, it's been excessively studied 
that permissive hypotension is very beneficial in controlling that bleeding and not making it worse. How quickly, once you start getting fluids, can you buffer down their systolic PG? So let's say they're at uh, 100. Mm -hmm. That can be flowing a bunch of fluids. Uh, just maybe keep open. And it starts dropping down. If we open that up again, how quickly does the PG change? I mean, that all depends on um, how quickly they're losing fluids, if they're still losing fluids. Um, that's very patient specific. I mean, you can you can pressure back a patient and get their blood pressure, you know, up from 70 to 90 um, with a good 500 uh, cc's um, pressure bagging, but that's going to be transient. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that his pressure will start to fall again um, unless you're controlling his bleeding. And with the GI bleed, you're not going to be controlling his bleeding, right? There's not really anything you can do about it. So you want to, you don't want to load him with two liters of normal saline and be like, you get him to the hospital, like, Doc, I got his blood pressure up to like 110. They never get a control of that bleeding for the next three hours. And that guy bleeds out and dies. So, neurogenic shock. I was wrong, guys. I'm glad you questioned me. <laughs> Vasodilation, and maybe I'm getting, I'm trying to think of the various patients that I've had with spinal transections. Question is, because you said that uh, with neurogenic shock it causes the peripheral veins to stretch. Right. So well, yeah, the erectile peeling muscles are controlled with the parasympathetic drive, and my patients that I've seen with spinal cord injuries are usually cold and clammy. Um, now, I understand the reasoning behind the warm, dry, and red skin, um, and you know what? For for testing reasons, I think you should just remember vasodilation. All right with neurogenic shock. You're going to have vasodilation below the uh, site of injury. Vasodilation generally will uh, give you warm warm and dry skin. Um, so blood, low blood pressure because you have the vasodilation. Slow pulse, that's that uh, uh, reflex oftentimes. Um, the physical exam findings of paralysis, weakness, whatever. Um, and then the priapism um, can happen with that. Um, neurogenic shock, you want to immobilize. Um, consider other possibilities of shock. Um, a neurogenic shock patient could easily also have a hemorrhagic shock, right? Um, because if they're in an incident traumatic enough to sever their spine, it certainly can cause internal bleeding, um, and so you can think of other things as well. Um, and then we talked about it's easy to treat neurogenic shock. If it's pure neurogenic shock, and you give those pressors, their blood pressure comes up pretty quickly. <laughs> compensation. Um, so this is the other factors in your body that's trying to compensate for the shock. Sufficient response results in Compensated shock, insufficient re response by the body is obviously decompensated shock. So compensated shock, you still have you you still have tissue perfusion. You compensate for it, um, and it's reversible. Decompensated is when that blood pressure drops regardless. All right. So the body's doing what it can. So like ca cardiogenic shock, they hold their blood pressure for a while. That's compensated, right? Their vasculature is compensating for that bad pump by vasoconstricting all their vessels. Well, at some point, if nothing's done to help that heart, that pump's going to get so bad that the vasculature can't compensate anymore, right? And then the blood pressure drops quickly. That's decompensated shock. Decompensated shock is generally when people recognize shock. It's been happening 
for a while, but they don't recognize it until the patient's blood pressure actually drops. And they're like, oh crap, I think this patient's in shock. Well, they've been in shock. They've just been compensating. So when they, when they decompensate, that's when you get end organ damage. Um, irre irreversible shock is obviously when you get to that point where it's just too late. Um, even if you give them volume, clotting factors, stop the bleeding, um, everything else, those organs have gone through such a, an amount of time without oxygen and everything else that they're already dead and you can't bring those back, right? Brain cells die, heart cells die, kidney function, you get end organ damage too much, too long a time, and it's irreversible and you can't bring, you can't save that. So once they get into that irreversible, is that also too late for donation? Generally, yeah. Um, the uh, you guys have heard of the golden hour, right? Irreversible shock is usually right after that golden hour, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, that golden hour is during compensated shock. And then they start decompensating and going to irreversible really quickly. So obviously outcomes are better when, when you can maintain a compensated state. Um, the key is to be able to identify that they're, that patient is in shock. Um, so how, how do you identify it? A septic patient has normal blood pressure. How do you identify that this patient is in compensated shock or is going to be shortly increase in heart rate, increase in heart rate. how how increased because you you, you you get a septic patient you think that their heart's going to be increased anyway right they've got a fever um, they're they're sick so you think all oh, their heart rates should be you know around 100 110 or whatever um, in a fever patient um, so when do you think that maybe this is a shock Type setting. What's that? All right. Yeah. So symptoms will will certainly start to line up. What are the things that you're looking for with septic with septic shock or just sepsis in general? You talked about tachycardia. Yeah, and somebody can be in sepsis, and you can even go into severe sepsis before they're in shock, right? Um, so, like, if you get a sudden spike in heart rate, spike in um, uh, res respiratory rate, um, then, you know, all of a sudden, that patient's body's really starting to uh, go into overload. That means that the infection that's going on is setting off a huge uh, cytokine response, causing massive vasodilation everywhere, and the heart all of a sudden is like, all right, we've got to compensate for this. And the blood pressure might even start to trend down a little bit as the heart rate really starts to crank up. You know, like, oh crap, we gotta really help this patient. That's why with sepsis we give such amount of volume right off the bat, even before we think they might be in shock. We give them a ton of volume, right? Because it, it's gonna lead to it if if you don't. All right. Um, so sepsis. Give them a yeah, sepsis is 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 a volume issue. Obviously, you need to be careful with patients with CHF, but even a patient with CHF, you're going to need to give them some volume. You just might have to intubate them. Now, with hemorrhagic shock, you've been talking about not giving them fluid overload. Septic shock, can you still do yeah. fluid overload? Exactly. So, hemorrhagic shock, you can have that permissive hypotension, right? Actively bleeding patient, because you don't want to make the bleeding worse, um, and you're not giving clotting factors. Um, in the hospital, they get a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, right, where they're getting just as much platelets and just as much factors as they are getting blood. Um, so we're repla replacing all of those factors so that we can help with the clotting and the bleeding and give them volume. But in a pre-hospital setting, you guys just have the normal saline. You might have blood if you're transferring from another hospital, right, but most of the time it's just red blood cells. Um, so you have, to, uh, you have to be careful with... Hemorrhagic shock. So when we've got a CHF or we're comfortable with uh, 
fluids because of sepsis. And we eventually have to innovate them because they've got really dumpy wet lungs. So we need to do the positive pressure ventilation is that going to force that back into the bloodstream? Or, uh, okay. So they're just not able to get that pressure to kind of force that back in there so that it eventually will pass out. Is that what the. In a CHF patient? Yeah. If they're getting too much volume? If they're getting too much volume. And right. Obviously, they get junkier lungs and yeah. they can't get that, that oxygen transfer. Right. So when we get positive pressure, is that how we're able to really When you get positive pressure, you, right, you're pushing fluid out of the interstitial uh, tissue of the lungs. Okay. Um, and it's it's getting back into the bloodstream. Um, you still have a problem with the heart because in a C, even though the heart's not a direct problem with the sepsis, um, that heart, you're still making the heart work harder. And it's already a bad pump, right? Um, so you can innovate and cause that uh, positive pressure to, to improve the lung function, improve your oxygenation, um, which will improve uh, tissue oxygenation around you know, the entire system. But you still have a bad heart with a bad pump. So that is going to have to be addressed at some point. Um, likely, a patient like that will need dopamine. Sepsis patient with CHF, likely, I mean, they're going to need fluid. So if that patient is going to get intubated. They're going to need dopamine. Does that make sense? All right. So hypovolemic shock, uh, we, we talked about this. Um, you're reducing cardiac output um, and reducing the ability of the pump to direct blood where it needs to go. I like that. Mechanisms of compensation. You just, you, your body's just trying to hold it together, right? That is a great utilization of duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> So um, other factors that are involved in shock, your baroreceptors. Remember when we learned about the baroreceptors? The aortic arch, carotid sinuses, chemoreceptors. That is mostly detecting carbon dioxide. I mean, there are chemoreceptors with oxygen too, but they're much more sensitive with carbon dioxide. Those chemoreceptors are generally where, do you guys remember? All right. Yeah, you've got you've got uh, uh, chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata. Um, you guys know all about parasympathetic, sympathetic. Sympathetic system is activated to compensate, right? That that makes sense. Um, the mechanism for that vasoconstriction. So angiotensin. This one is a good one to understand, and I think it might pop up. Um, but angiotensin is a uh, protein created by the kidneys, causes vasoconstriction of the peripheral vasculature. So if the kidneys see that they're not getting enough blood flow and they don't think that there's a, uh, blood pressure is good enough, they'll release angiotensin. Um, in order to create vasoconstriction and improve that blood pressure. <coughs> they limit, the angiotensin basically limits uh, flow through the capillary beds. So they bypass the capillary beds and go straight from the arterial system to the venous system in order to improve that blood pressure. So when that happens, that's when you get blood that's not going through the capillary beds and you're still trying to maintain the blood pressure, you're getting the cool, pale skin and you get a narrow pulse pressure. <laughs> so, with that, we were talking about the, the raw system. The raw system? Reticular activating system? Uh-huh. Okay. I was just confused because... Wait. The RAS system? Oh, okay. Double A. Okay, so not reticular activating system. 
is the renin, uh, angiotensin, aldosterone, whatever. Um, yes, that's that system. The only, the only reason I was asking was because angiotensin. Right. The sorry if I confused everyone. Let's see. I was just curious. That's all. I mean, I know it has to angiotensin and kidneys go hand in hand. Right. You can't do that. Kidneys. When we did it, the red. No, you 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 are you are correct. That's probably a little bit of a misnomer. Created by the kidneys, I guess indirectly. Right. It's not made in the kidneys. Okay. Renin is re right. Right. Renin is released by the kidneys and then converted into angiotensin in the liver. Right. Yeah. That's that's a typo. It needs to be, okay. needs to be corrected. Sorry. Mike. You're learning something. <laughs> <laughs> So the initial, I guess the initial response is from the kidneys, but the angiotensin itself is a byproduct of the renin that's released from the kidneys and converted into the angiotensin from the liver. So the 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 origination is in the kidneys, but he's right, the angiotensin actually is made in the liver. So this is what I'm talking about with um, angiotensin um, creates um, a bypassing of these capillary beds and goes straight from the arterial system to the venous system to uh, ensure good blood pressure. So it causes constriction of all those smooth muscles um, to bypass the capillary beds. Contractility, so epinephrine and norepinephrine. This is also kind of a misnomer. It's create. It's not necessarily created by the kidneys. It's created by the what? Uh, the adrenal medulla. Yeah. <laughs> so it increases the heart rate, increases the heart contractions, um, leads to tachycardia and agitation. Right? They get very anxious. Uh, compensation for shock, fluid retention, so your body uh, releases ADH and aldosterone, reabsorb sodium and water. Um, these are also um, at the kidneys. Um, ADH is the same thing as, as what? It's yes, but uh, we give a synthetic form called vasopressin. Um, you guys don't use vasopressin on in the in the buses anymore, right? Um, we actually don't use it all that much um, in the emergency department either, but it's still on hand, and sometimes we do use it a last ditch effort. But it's still used. Vasopressin is still used in the ICU um, as a vasopressor uh, drip to maintain blood pressure. Um, so the aldosterone holds on to sodium. ADH holds on to water. Um, this decreases your urinary output, right? So that can be a sign of shock. Patient has good blood pressure, relatively stable heart rate. They're getting fluids, but they have little to no urinary output. That's a sign of shock. Failure of compensation. So when it begins to fail, um, those cell membranes, capillary walls break down. Um, when you get bad blood flow, that leads to what? Clots. Um, so hypotension will lead to clots in all of your organs. So even if you fix the problem, but you've got a whole bunch of clots blocking uh, blood flow to those organs, you still got end organ failure, right? Um, Irreversible shock. This is profound metabolic acidosis. Um, there's little cardiac output. Um, peripheral resistance can't keep up. Blood pressure um, sucks. 
there's no uh, compensation for it, and uh, the body will quickly die. So you guys understand all of that. I don't know why now it says uncompensated instead of decompensated, but it's the same thing. Know those stages. Um, I don't know why we're going through the same thing again. Compensated, down, anxious. This one's important just because so often we treat an anxiety patient as anxiety where, you know, I'd be anxious too if I had a PE. I'd be hyperventilating and tachycardic and whatnot. So sometimes that can be a uh, red herring is a crazy anxious lady. Um, but usually uh, bad stuff will cause a patient to be anxious. Uh, we talked about this. This is just going through the same thing. Responsive to alter. I guess this is an important part is decompensated shock. Will the patient have, what's the patient's mental status in a compensated shock? Normal, right? Because they've got good perfusion. Their blood pressure is good. As soon as that blood pressure drops and they become decompensated, what happens to their mental status? Right. They start to become altered. So you got an altered septic patient. You know what you're looking at, right? Irreversible, obviously. Shock is from a cellular level, um, and those cells are so badly injured that you can't save them. You have multi-system organ failure. Patient cannot respond uh, to any kind of treatment, and they um, I, This is a terrible example of a, a hemorrhage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all right. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> Types of hemorrhage. So capillary hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. This is just going to be minimally oozing, right? This is probably your average Spokane patient. This is a capillary hemorrhage. Blood just oozing from the wound. It actually clots off quickly. Self-regulatory. Not, not a problem. Venous hemorrhage flows a little bit more quickly. Uh, the blood is dark. Um, it can sometimes be extensive depending on which vein is cut, right? Um, you can bleed to death really quickly if your jugular vein is, is, is cut, right? Um, so still obviously take those venous hemorrhages seriously. Arterial hemorrhages, um, these are the rapid spurting bright red blood, you got to fix it quickly um, or they're going to lose too much blood. Um, how much blood is too much blood? When, when are you going to get into irreversible shock with blood loss? It'll surprise you. Two liters. Two liters of blood, and they're pretty much already into irreversible shock. Now, peds will be different um, because two liters in an adult is about 30 to 35%. Um, so the percentage in a, in a peds is going to be different. It just depends on how big the kid is. <laughs> I mean, if you can replace and replace appropriately, then you're replacing what they're losing, right? This is loss. Um, so two liters lost is irreversible. Um, if, if that, if, because those cells are already damaged. Uh, but if you're replacing, then, then you're in good shape. So capillary, you got the oozing. Venous can be a steadily flow, and then arterial, those are your squirters. Hemostasis, this is what uh, 
Joel was talking about up here when he was talking about the matrix um, um, and clotting off that fibrin matrix. So the phases of hemostasis, there's a vascular phase, a platelet phase, and a coagulation phase. Vascular phase is you get a torn blood vessel or, <laughs> or whatever, um, and what happens when a blood vessel gets injured? It constricts, right? Just slow down blood flow to um, minimize loss. So that's your vascular phase, is that vasoconstriction. Um, and it causes reduced flow to the area that's injured. The platelet phase is you get an aggregation of platelets. You get a clumping of platelets. It's an unstable clot. Why? Right. So it has not um, been reinforced with that fibrin matrix, so it's a very unstable clot. Um, it can kind of it can halt hemorrhage, but that can easily be blown and patients start bleeding again um, until they get a good fibrin clot form. Um, so that's why, I mean, you can give red blood cells, you can give platelets, but if you don't give the cofactors, you're never going to get a very good stable uh, clot formation to stop that bleeding, right? Coagulation phase is your clotting factors. This triggers that reaction to form those strong protein fibers, fibrin. Um, and then that, st that, that fibrin sticks together and it traps the red blood cells, causes a very stable clot. <laughs> what the hell was that? Well, I, was just <laughs> I the voice that was talking. Uh, I was just curious, how long do you think for fiber to actually get in place? Um, it's it's generally not that not that uh, not that long. It depends on a lot of factors, meaning how well their your blood pressure and your flow is. Um, so you know, putting a time span, um, I guess, on an. <laughs> Pyt. That's my wife, pretty young thing, right? And my picture when she calls is her in this swimsuit. It's awesome. <laughs> she doesn't even know it, or she'd be, we do. she'd be upset. She would be upset that I told you. <laughs> so let's not let's not let's not pass that on. <laughs> but yeah, a good fiber and clot. I mean, five to ten minutes in an otherwise healthy individual. But if they're hypotensive, if they've got other issues going on, and they're not able to get proper circulation and perfusion, it's going to take longer. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is what we talked about before. Factors affecting is what does the wound look like? It's a big, open um, wound that's going to be difficult to uh, cause hemostasis and clotting. How's their blood pressure? And you asked that question before the slide. It was just so good. Um, so, which one's going to be which one's going to be worse? What kind of laceration? The one that's just completely uh, transects the vessel, or the one that has a that longitudinal uh, shearing? The longitudinal one. This one you can get vasoconstriction and really slow down the blood flow, so that you can get a good clot, right? This one you get vasoconstriction. What does that do to the wound? It actually opens it up a little bit more, um, so it has uh, more of a difficult um, um, uh, clotting. So factors that affect the hemostasis, and so once a clot is formed, uh, fracture movement. So if you have a fracture that's bleeding, you want to stabilize it or splint it in what position? relatively how you found it unless it's ridiculous, right? Uh, I mean, you can reduce, obviously, in the field, um, 
and oftentimes reduction of a fracture will slow down the bleeding. Um, but uh, you want to minimize that fracture moving, right? That fracture moves and they're going to start bleeding again. So you really want to splint that well. Um, body temperature, we talked about that again, right? The cold temp worsens, or I should say lessens your clotting. Um, so you want to keep that patient warm. And then, of course, if they're on anticoagulants. Um, four stages of hemorrhage. So that we, this is what we kind of talked about before. Normally, at any given time, the average adult has five liters of blood in them. Class 1 hemorrhage, they lose 15%. Class 2, 15 to 30%. Class 3 is that 30 to 40%. And that's when you're in trouble. If you reach class 3 without replacement, you're done. You've lost your golden hour. And then class 4 is over 2 liters. So class 1, you're going to get that compensated shock. Right? You've lost about 15%. The rest of the body can kind of make up for it and maintain your blood pressure. Your heart increases. You get vasoconstriction. Um, all of the above. You're still getting oxygen to all your tissues, perfusing well because your respiratory rate increases. Um, still got good urinary output. Class 2, um, you'll start to get those subtle signs of shock where you re that tachycardia really becomes evident. More than just bumped heart rate, that patient really is becoming tachycardic. Diastolic pressure um, starts to increase and you get that narrow pulse pressure, which is different than what... So hemorrhagic and volemic, or hypovolemic shock, you get narrow pulse pressures. Which, ones, which one do you get wide pulse pressure? Just. Neurogenic, yeah. I heard a whole bunch of stuff that meant the same thing as neurotronic, right? <laughs> um, and then, yeah, your blood pressure will start to decrease a little bit. Class 3, that's when we're talking, we're getting close to that 2 liters, um, and your compensatory mechanisms just can't handle it. And you get those classic signs of shock. If you don't replace, then you have end organ damage and patient dies. In class 3, it says pulse barely palpable, in the most, in most cases, if you have class three, you're really not feeling much of a peripheral pulse. A lot of tachypnea. Um, class three, obviously, their blood pressure is dropping, so their mentation is not good. Um, pale, cool, diaphoretic, ashen, look like death. Um, no, no urinary output. Class four. This is. Too much blood loss, and they're minimal, minimally responsive, con confused. Generally, they're comatose. Uh, you don't see very many class four people still uh, awake. Moving rapidly towards unconsciousness, yeah, it's probably because I didn't recognize that patient was um, class four until they were already comatose, but. Um, Patient survival after the two liters is unlikely. Let's see. Let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back. A lot of this stuff we've we've been over in other lectures. This is just your assessment of hemorrhagic shock. So, same as any other assessment, right? Seems safe. Um, and I love I love that answer. Like it's where every question that I have is. I see. Um, 
<laughs> I appreciate it. I like it. Um, primary assessment, secondary assessment, obviously rapid and focused, um, detailed exam, and then what's important here is your reassessment um, during transport with all of these uh, types of patients. Um, Scene hazards, obviously safety is first, as you guys always remind me. Um, I like this, examine weather conditions affecting emergency scene. Um, I don't know how closely anybody's ever examined the weather um, and affecting what, where they're going to go and what they're going to do. But. On the fire side, knowing you know, working the landmark, working out the fire site, it's that decision comes into play where you know if that patient needs the road code or needs stuff, they need the ambulance secure code. Mm -hmm. But knowing that the road conditions are at this point, they're not going to become the code. Yeah. That puts them in the way of Right. Look, Craig. I love this picture. Appropriate standard precautions. If you know it's a hemorrhagic patient, they both got their eyewear on as they're driving to the scene with their gloves, synchronized. That's awesome. Music in the background. Oh, Laban, don't act like this isn't you, buddy. <laughs> the only difference is these guys don't have a sweet mustache. <laughs> and they got longer fingers. Longer, longer, longer fingers? At least one. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. Um, so, any kind of shock patient, you want to keep them warm, right? You want to make sure you, you know the mechanism of injury so that um, you can account for any possible internal hemorrhage or spine injury or what, whatever. Um, that the mechanism of injury is always uh, extremely important. Um, determine the time elapsed between when you found them and the injury occurred and the amount uh, of blood loss that they have. Um, sometimes that's difficult to assess, um, but that's needed, especially when you're calling calling it in. Um, how much have you given? How much has the patient lost? Um, those are all super important factors. Um, anticipate shock. Um, you want to uh, locate all pa possible patients. Um, I guess sometimes that's a um, for you guys. I guess sometimes that's a, a challenge um, in certain situations, trying to locate all of them. Um, and then your your oversight. The primary assessment, like you guys were saying, super fast. Um, initial mental status, you can tell really quick how their airway is, how the breathing is, how their mental status, mental status is with a couple questions, right? And as you're doing that, you're looking at their skin and you're getting that primary assessment done. Um, Non-traumatic causes, it's more of CAV than ABC, right? Um, because if you've got a non-traumatic shock state, um, you're worried about that, uh, about the circulation. Um, and there's less of a chance for an airway problem, but you'll get to that anyway. Um, so you rule out the spinal injury, high concentration oxygen, um, and then you've got the rapid trauma assessment that takes about five minutes, um, sometimes faster. Um, you know the mechanism of injury. You can quickly inspect what needs um, to be looked at from head to toe. Um, and then you can control any bleeding if you have significant hemorrhage. What's your best way to control bleeding? Direct pressure. Direct pressure. Fantastic. Um, so as you're looking for a hemorrhage, you're going from head to toe. Um, you rule out any injury that compromises the airway, um, you examine the neck, um, and you can look at the jugular veins. That is sometimes, or I should say not sometimes, most of the time a very difficult physical exam finding because, you know, a lot of your patients are uh, overweight, um, and so assessing their jugular vein is, is impossible. Um, but um, 
like we talked about before in the head and neck uh, lecture, if you've got a uh, serious hemorrhage from the neck, it's important to have an occlusive dressing, not just um, uh, a, um, you know, a gauze dressing or whatever, but it needs to be occlusive so that air can't uh, um, get into it or through it. Um, you always suspect um, in any significant trauma, spinal injury. Um, and then you look at, as you're examining the abdomen, uh, you're looking at signs of bruising that can indicate internal uh, bleeding. So does anybody know what ecchymosis around the umbilicus is called? <laughs> it's called a colon sign, and it is a sign of uh, intestinal bleeding, internal bleeding. You got blue, if you got bruising, um, on the flanks, both sides. It, do you know what sign that's called? It's called the Gray Turner sign, and that's uh, generally um, bleeding, like splenic rupture, um, pancreatic uh, injury, but internal bleeding as well. Um, so look for those those signs uh, on the abdomen. There's a typo. I swear I fixed that and I, it just doesn't didn't save it, I guess. What's the sign where you've got the A in your upper left quadrant and the bird in your shoulder? Duplicative of a splenic rupture. Splenic rupture. Um, I don't know that it has a name. I mean, it's referred pain with the shoulder. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know the name. I thought it was called colons. Colons? No, colons should be the umbilical. Who knows? I could be wrong. I had massive brain swelling, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's a, my wife blames it on that. Everything. Everything's due to that. Um, so, as part of your rapid trauma assessment, obviously you're listening to the lungs um, as you're. Uh, assessing airway and breathing, making sure that there's not a pneumothorax. Um, where do you do your needle decompression? Okay, midclavicular second and costal space. What uh, size needle are you using? Fourteen. Yep. Good. All right. Um, you can in any kind of penetrating chest trauma, you have to suspect pericardial tamponade. Um, sometimes that is difficult uh, to assess because if they got a stab wound to the chest and they're hypotensive, could have easily just have a rupture of high ventricle, right? Um, so sticking the needle in there to try to do a pericardial synthesis um, is uh, iffy if you don't absolutely know what's going on. Um, the EKG is obviously a fantastic tool um, in getting a, 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 correct, a correct cardiac rhythm so that you can um, treat appropriately uh, based on that. Um, because not always are you going to know if a patient's hyperkalemic, right? But you can tell that on an EKG. Um, and you can uh, treat appropriately for uh, hyper-K. So rapid, more on the rapid trauma, so you're going down uh, past the abdomen, pelvic, and groin region. Know, knowing that a pelvic fracture or femur fracture um, can account for a blood loss at two liters. So you can fit two liters into the pelvis, two liters into the, le into the thighs. Um, and patient can have uh, life-threatening blood loss uh, that's not significantly obvious. Um, so you assess the extremities, obviously, for any deformities. You check the pulses, capillary refill, <clears throat> sensation, muscle tone. Um, so you're checking for your neural assessment as well. Um, The, like we've talked about before, those classic shock signs are part of what stage? 
decompensated, right? So, and that's delayed. So that takes time. And you wanted to recognize that the patient had was in shock before the classic shock signs uh, are apparent, right? This is the best way to be in just uh, based on MOI. Being, yeah, mechanism of injury. Um, also being very astute to changes in your vital signs and rechecking vital signs often. Um, also mental status, right? Mental status is one of your big ones because if you've got a normal patient and all of a sudden they're confused, I mean, you've, you've kind of, uh, it's delayed at that point, um, but that becomes more of an obvious sign. Um, but if you want to catch it before that decompensation happens, um, you're really going to do that with your with your vital signs um, and being astute, and then of course understanding the history. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we talked about that. So as you're getting through your trauma assessment, you're checking for muscle tone, um, uh, sensation, checking for signs of neurogenic shock, um, and then you know hopefully you'll catch it before that Cushing's reflex starts. Um, then your focus trauma assessment. Um, you know, these are the, the obvious signs. You're looking at um, those focused exams of the injured areas. Um, and then, you know, you, you've got your vital signs. You're doing repeat vital signs. Reassessment is always very important. Um, and you're preparing the patient for transport. Um, other considerations is um, the uh, internal hemorrhages, like we talked about before, with the bruising, um, with the legs. Um, if you've got uh, obvious pelvic fracture, obvious femur fracture, um, you've got bruising around the abdomen, you want to be mindful and thinking about internal hemorrhaging. So like what we talked about is being, being very astute and watching your vital signs closely, that increasing pulse rate, and then as you're feeling that radial pulse, if it's continually getting weaker and weaker, um, the clammy skin, orthostatic hypotension is going to happen before they get hypotension on your stretcher. Um, but, you know, do you want to always test the patient by having them stand up? That's not always um, um, prudent, obviously. The, uh, and then, of course, after your trauma assessment, uh, you've got the patient fairly stabilized. You can do a detailed physical exam and make sure you're checking everything head to toe. Reassess often. Uh, every five minutes, I think, in some of these patients, shock patients, you can be reassessing them even more often than that. Vital signs every five minutes. But you can do physical exam stuff almost continuously, right? Um, and then you can lengthen that out with more stable uh, patients. Let's see. We talked about that. Pay very close attention to your pulse rate and your blood pressure as you kind of start to see ch trends, even if they're not drastic. Um, and then any interventions that you've performed, you want to make sure that uh, those are good. Meaning, like, if you think that you effectively stopped bleeding in an extremity and you put a dressing on there, you need to make sure that you're checking that and making sure that it's not continually bleeding underneath that dressing, right? It's better, it'd be better if you had, you know, somebody putting their, their finger on that uh, a bleeding extremity all the way there, right? All right. And then management. You know, we, we, talk, we talked about this stuff. Um, ABCs, direct pressure, splinting, um, immobilizing that fracture so that you don't, you're not blowing any clots and causing uh, more bleeding, um, and tourniquets as a last resort if needed. Um, you guys know this stuff. We go through the ABCs, um, and we've already talked about that with uh, monitoring your oxygen and cabinography. Um, direct pressure is vital. Quickly apply, apply your dressings. Um, let's see. Direct pressure controls most bleeding, um, except for the, those more more 
persistent hemorrhages or more internal um, that you can't necessarily get to. Um, open skull fracture, you got to be careful with direct pressure, right? We talked about that. You don't want to put a finger through a brain. That's bad form. Um, you don't want to put pressure on the eye orbits, so avoid placing pressure directly on the globe of the eye. Um, and, of course, you don't want to strangle a patient in trying to stop their bleeding, right? So don't tourniquet their neck. Um, limb splinting, you we're immobilizing. We talked about that. We, do, we want to uh, maintain the clot so that we can control bleeding at those frac flac fracture sites. Um, let's see. If you're a patient with a severed carotid artery, what can you do? To Point direct pressure. Point direct pressure. Yeah. And they might have neurologic deficits because of it, but your brain has um, uh, compensatory flow, right? The circle of Willis. Um, and the vertebral arteries, the two sides are connected. So they'll still get blood flow from the other side, um, and that's better than bleeding out. If you, don't, if you let that carotid artery just go, how long is it going to take before they're done? Right? Minutes. So uh, lesser of two evils there. They might have a little bit of neurologic deficits, um, but they'll be alive. Um, I don't know why the, the consult instructor, um, you know, this is going along with the protocols depending on um, what your medical director and whichever district you're working in, um, if they want to use elevation. So uh, elevating a bleeding extremity to try to decrease um, uh, blood flow to the area. Um, that's controversial, so that might differ, um, but you can consider that uh, in controlling bleeding if it's not going well, right? Um, I don't have a problem with elevation as long as it's not uh, excessive. Um, because if you're trying to save a limb, um, they're bleeding out and you don't want them to bleed to death, but you also don't want them to lose their arm or whatever, right? Um, if you put direct pressure on that and elevate, um, especially say you have a tourniquet and you elevate and you you know that tourniquet's on there for um, a good amount of time um, that's going to cause some significant neurological deficits and they could possibly um, lose function in that arm uh, that usually doesn't happen until about hour three um, but you're also going to cause um, a compartment syndrome or crust injury like effect when that tourniquet's released, right? That tourniquet's released and everything that's built up in that arm, all those cytokines and injury just gets flooded into the system and they go into like sudden shock. Um, all of that potassium um, is just like a crush injury, right? Uh, so you have to be careful with, uh, with those things in releasing those tourniquets as well, um, especially if it's been on there for a little while. So it, it depends. Depends on the injury. Depends on how much blood loss. Um, depends on how you're stopping your blood blood loss. And that's probably why they like you to call in and find out um, what the doc wants you to do because every every case is going to be specific. I don't love these. These really only work for like oozing stuff. You know, post-op patients that have oozing from their laceration um, or their incision side or something like that. But for actual Blood clot or hemorrhage support, um, these things are not effective. Tourniquets, last resort. Um, this causes limb ischemia and death in six hours. Um, I think that number's a little bit generous um, because I've seen countless individuals lose their legs um, after three hours. Um, and when you have applied in a, tour a tourniquet, wait to remove it until they're at the hospital so they can get the support. 
happen when that uh, patient gets flooded with all those factors. <laughs> yep, calcium, bicarb, um, and you can be set for, uh, and fluids, because you're flooding the kidneys, getting ready for all of that, uh, all that muscle breakdown, all that potassium. So easy external hemorrhage obviously is a lot easier. It be, it's more obvious to find. Uh, extremity injuries um, should be easier to control than uh, more central uh, external hemorrhages, uh, but can be controlled uh, most effectively by direct pressure. Um, if you don't have a tourniquet, what else could you use as a tourniquet like? You can use a belt. You can use your blood pressure cuff. Yeah. Um, See. So internal hemorrhages, uh, we talked about this. You'll see uh, contusions. Maybe you'll see bruising on the skin. Sometimes you won't see anything. Um, so you have to be just aware that there could be internal bleeding. Um, let's see. That slide's not. So blood, when it comes out of the GI tract, is going to look what? They throw up old blood from their stomach. It's going to look like coffee grounds. They poop out old blood. It's going to be black and tarry, right? Um, new blood is bright and red. Those are if you're getting bright red, significant blood from uh, lower GI, that's a significant blood loss, and you've got to add, jump on that quick. Um, let's see, we talked about that, black tarry stools, other, so vaginal uh, bleeding, you can have a lot of trauma, placenta previa, do we, do we know what that is? So this is a pregnant female and their placenta is over the cervix or the cervical os. So when they, if they have any kind of, uh, even just intercourse that moves around that cervix, disrupts the cervix, or if they go into preterm labor or anything like that and the cervix changes, they can really bleed out because it disrupts the placenta before that baby's ever ready to come, right? Um, generally, you are not going to bleed out through your urinary system. Um, maybe over a long period of time if the patient was on blood thinners and you just let it go. But that would never happen in pre-hospital setting. So, um, <laughs> acute trauma is obviously a lot easier to recognize than chronic. Um, and chronic blood loss is, you, you oftentimes you just get anemic, but the patient is comp compensating because it's been slowly going down for so long. The patient could have a hemoglobin of like six, which most people would be dead from, but because they've been slowly dropping for so long, their body's used to it and compensating for it. All right. We talked about direct pressure on head wounds. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Yeah, they've, they've, he's got this patient in hyper uh, hyperextended state. He obviously has trauma to his head. Now maybe it's <laughs> <laughs> those Canadians. <laughs> what's it, what's that? <laughs> oh yeah, he's probably super nice guy. <laughs> so eyes, we talked about that. Avoid putting too much pressure on the globe. Um, if the globe is ruptured, they can lose vitreous contents and you can't replace those. Um, you have to be careful about uh, the orbit as well. If you've got an orbit fracture around the eye, if it feels unstable at all, you don't want to put any pressure on that either. So we're doing our physical exam and checking our head and our you got to be careful with those. If there's any obvious trauma there, um, then you got to be careful with your exam and not moving any of those bones because they're they're one they're fragile and there's so many of them um, that 
um, you know, any kind of fracture can lead to fragments into the into the globe, into the um, uh, posterior space. So we talked about the occlusive dressings. Do not employ circumferential bandages on mass. Right? Um, gaping wounds. Gaping wounds are tough to put direct pressure on, right? It's when you generally need to pack. Pack and pressure and gaping wounds. You don't want to pack with multiple 2x2s, 4x4s. If it's a gaping wound, you want to pack with something big enough that when you pull it out, you're going to get all of it out, right? Keep that in mind. Crush injuries um, can obviously be a source of hemorrhage. Um, they're difficult to, uh, to assess all the time. And then, of course, you need to uh, remember to treat for the complications of crush injuries themselves with hyper K and everything else that goes with it, uh, rhabdomyolysis, etc. The shock and hemorrhage, this is just a fantastic slide, right? Um, Let's see. We've gone through that. Tension pneumo we talked about. These are other signs of attention pneumo. Deviated trachea, absent lung sound. That's ipsilateral, right? Low blood pressure because of that decreased preload that it causes. And then you get elevated uh, jugular venous distension. Why do you get an increased JVD? For, yeah, for the same reason, right? You don't have, blood's not getting into the heart well, so it's it's backing backing up. Good. Um, all right. So this is you know hemorrhagic shock. This fluid treatment. Um, you guys don't have whole blood. Um, I don't know if some places outside of the United States use whole blood, like universal whole whole blood. You run into a lot of you could run into a lot of issues with that. So in the United States we. Pre-hospital, we stick with the normal saline and um, do our other resuscitative measures when we get them to the hospital. Um, you don't want to return them to normal vital signs. You just want them to have a permissive hypotension, right? You want you want pressures just high enough that you're getting perfusion, you're getting mentation, your heart rate's controlled, um, and um, you don't want to disrupt. What the body's already trying to do. Um, you're right. Uh, generally, I mean, you can do some permissive hypertension um, that low. Um, this is for. Uh, let's see. Your number. Your number is probably going to be. Uh, I think 90 is a safe bet. Um, you're going to get different numbers and different sources. Um, and in treatment, um, you know, you could really go anywhere from 75 to 90, depending on your physical exam. If you have a systolic blood pressure of 75 or 80, and they're talking to you and mentating just fine, you're you're done, right? You're good. But if you've got a blood pressure systolic of 80, if you've got a systolic of 100, and they're not mentating. And what do you need to do? Probably need to bump that up a little bit, right? So a lot of it's based on physical exam. For test purposes, I think 90 systolic is a pretty generalized number. All right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you're gonna, you can have other deficits than just... Uh, hypertension causing your different physical findings, right? All right. Um, so when we're talking about fluid resusc resuscitation, what is your best catheter? 14. 14 and short or long? Short. 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 Good. Um, that. What? What? What's that lock called? So, so long. Gosh, you guys are so good, Gary. Man. All right, temperature control, you want to keep them, what, warm or cold? Warm. Hypothermia does what to your clotting? Yeah. All right. And so when you're giving them fluids, 
you want to give them room temperature normal saline or do you want to give them warm warm fluids good that's going to be an even bigger shock on their system than just the environment the environment temperature right is if you're giving them cold fluids um, you're really going to cause some increased bleeding so your pharmacological intervention obviously uh, is limited. You guys do have resources and you can use um, some of your pressors and some of your medications, um, but you're limited. Um, so you, you do what you can do and do what you know, right? Um, calm and reassuring. This is very important. Remember, walk into every situation with a smile. Calm, reassuring. Make sure that that patient isn't anxious. They're, they're not blowing off every bit of CO2 that they have because they're hyperventilating and they're freaking out and they're anxious because they're in shock. Um, so you try to help them out as much as you can from an emotional standpoint as well. But look at that. Look at those caring paramedics. It's just, it's just, it's just wonderful. What's that? <laughs> they probably are. Look at, are they? No, New York. Surprising. All right. We're done. Questions? Just another another fire hose kind of day. I met Tom back. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Sir? No. So, um, Wednesday, you're in to do the lecture for the career, right? Wednesday next week. Yep. So, I got Tuesday on the same day. Tuesday is last. Tuesday, you got, you got a lecture. Oh, Tuesday. Oh, you're right. Assistant. You're right. Yeah. And um, Wednesday, the career way, um, lecture in the morning.